Ladies and gentlemen, let's read Game into the comment video. We're going to be continuing our breakdown of Naughty Dog's Sinfo information regarding the PS4 uh, architecture. So, of course, this is part two, so we're going to be carrying on right where we left off. There is an article which corresponds to this, but I'd recommend you check out the first video in conjunction with the article because we go over quite a lot of stuff. But, of course, we're going to skip over it in this particular part. So... A couple of you guys have messaged me regarding the 80-20 rule that Naughty Dog did mention. We're going to go over that before we go into the PS4's system any further. So the 80-20, or sometimes known as the 90-10 rule, is pretty simple to understand. It basically means that, let's use the 80-20 rule, 80% um, of the time a piece of code that is going to be running on the CPU is going to be from a pool of code that's only about 20% of the total code that you've written. And so, rather than wasting your time optimizing the full 100% of the code, it's actually better from a performance standpoint, and especially if you're considering time as well, to focus on the 20% that's going to be most frequently run. So anyway, now we've got that little bit of information out of the way. Let's discuss the way the PS4 handles jobs. So we did discuss the PS3 um, in the previous video, and just as a brief reminder, of course, you had the the PPU pretty much set the jobs up and kick them over to the SPUs. So with the uh, PS4, it's kind of similar, but rather than the GPU which on the PS3 was pretty much there just for the purposes of rendering the graphics, in other words, to create the textures and to basically draw the game world. The PS4's GPU is a bit different. So you've still got a very similar type of architecture, however. You've got the first core, uh, which is core 0 in this case. You've got core 0 to 5. Uh, that's 6 cores total. Remember, there are 8 available for the, uh, the Jaguar inside the PS4, but that's 4 cores of two modules each, T two times four is eight, but two of those are allocated towards system. So in this case, you've got core zero, which handles the main game, and then it basically kicks jobs. To emphasize what kicking a job is, it basically just pushes the job over um, until that job is run, and then it just moves uh, to the next job, and so forth, and so forth. So... With the PS4, it handles the rendering, uh, the normal sta standard you know, graphics uh, assets we're talking about from the GPU side for a moment, as well as the GP GPU wavefronts. So what in the hell is a wavefront, I hear you cry. Well, no, there's no surfing involved, not even internet surfing. Instead, what basically happened is when the PS4 was originally created, when it was being first designed, and of course Mark Cerny, who is the lead architect, uh, architect on the machine, discussed this quite heavily, but um, <clears throat> basically speaking, sorry guys, it was designed or envisioned the the developers would want to run things such as cloth simulation, physics, fluids, AI, and so on and so forth on the GPU. And the GPU is a parallel processing monster. Modern day GPUs are capable of handling thousands of jobs, quite literally thousands, scheduled at once. So a wavefront, um, which by the way is AMD's term for this, um, NVIDIA have their own terminology, which is called warps. So if you've ever seen warp, um, and you're wondering what the hell it is in concern with like the Kepler or Maxwell architecture, then you know what the heck they're talking about. Um, and basically speaking, they are the most basic form of scheduling possible on the GPU. So each wavefront consists of 64 threads. 64, by the way, would be AMD's number. NVIDIA are different. They are currently using 32, just for your FYI. And doubly for your FYI, it's worth noting that NVIDIA were the first ones to really start to pioneer this. AMD kind of took a lot of their uh, ideas and kind of ran with them in their own direction, if you will because previously AMD were using a very long word. I think it was five, and then they moved over to four because it's more efficient, and now they're moving on to the more SIMD architecture. SIMD, by the way, is vitally important in all of this. SIMD, um, 
or SIMD, as some people call it, is Single Instruction Multi-Data. Now, that might sound really complicated, but it simply means that you get many different things working on the same problem. So, to use a really good analogy, and the same one I used in my article because I'm going to be lazy like that, let's assume that you are working in a warehouse, or let's assume that you're helping someone move house. Okay, so you see that... Oh, I don't know. They're trying to move a heavy ass box. Actually, let's use. Let's say that you're trying to help someone move house. That's more realistic. And let's say you've got a, a heavy ass box that you need help with. Let's say it's their, you know, huge CRT TV back in the day. Okay. Let's assume that you try to. Let's assume you watch them try to lift it, and after laughing for a moment of their, you know, being puny because they can't lift it by themselves, you eventually go over to help them. After yelling that they are once again a puny man. You would then help them grab one side of the box and you would both try to help out. So in other words, you're both trying to pretty much do the same job, right? So you've, you're basically pulling it together. And let's say that this is the heaviest television on Earth. It's maybe got some dark matter in there. So, you know, more of you would help out. Let's say you have three or four of you trying to help out move this large box. In other words, multiple people are trying to help move the same object or perform the same task, which is very similar how SIMD works. It's not exact, but it's pretty damn close. So what the PS4 does, utilizing the ACE, by the way, I've gone into this Previously, in the article, there's a link to this exact same thing, which goes into basically the PS4's compute structure and how that works. But the PS4's compute is very similar to the volcanic islands, which um, basically are the R9, 290, and 290Xs. Just for example, they've got much more beefed up compute structures. So they've got eight aces, each capable of eight Qs each. Now, I know what you're going to say. What the hell does that mean? It basically means that these aces, asynchronous com compute engines, basically pretty much manage the tasking. They manage the jobs that are going to be running on the GPU. Because the SP, the, the stream processors inside are like multiple cores, as we've discussed, 1152 of the little blighters. And you can, of course, have thousands of jobs being pretty much queued at once, right? So, obviously, not all of those jobs are being run at the same time per SPU. So, for example, you can have, say, let's just use SPU one as an example okay so you could have say two or three jobs queued on that thing but they're not all running at once they're not all being calculated simultaneously what's actually happening of course is that okay job one runs job two runs job three runs and so forth so what it will do is the it will basically make sure that it works within the parameters the games developer set most likely they don't want frame rates being affected by running compute so, in other words, they don't want, oh, I don't know, running AI to start tanking the frame rates to, say, sub-20 or whatever. And so, it will schedule or be able to drop a certain job if it feels something else has a higher importance. So, obviously, this will have been assigned by the engine creator or the programmers on the game. One would be forgiven to wonder why the hell the CPU can't just do all of this by itself. Why does it have to be lazy? Well, it's not. The CPU has generally been considered the smarter of the two, um, which is why we're starting to get into like HSA and um, that type of thing. And um, but in reality, it's not necessarily more powerful. In fact, it's not more powerful. In fact, if you look at the G flops available, the AMD Jaguar inside the PS4 has just over a hundred G flops. Um, Conservative estimate is 102. It could be all the way up to maybe about 110, 112, something like that, depending on the clock speed is basically what it comes down to. Meanwhile, the PS4's GPU is hitting almost two T-flops. So if you do, were to do a little bit mathematics on that, you can obviously see there's a large discrepancy. So the PS4's CPU, much like all CPUs, is smarter, but the GPU faster because it's basically a parallel processing monster because there are so many of these little cores are all working simultaneously towards the common good. So now let's move on to the memory caching and optimization and so forth. So we find out the 
cycles it actually takes to access various bits and bobs within the PS4. 220 cycles for the main system memory, which of course is the GDDR5. You're looking at 30 cycles for the level 2. Three cycles for the level one and uh, level one data and instruction cache, just to clarify. And the registers inside the uh, CPU are pretty much free. So basically, they are the fastest. Now, cycles are not the same as clock speed. Cycles, the slower, the slower the cycle, or rather the higher the cycle, the slower it is. In other words, a cycle, just to um, put a little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, I don't know, information on this. I'm sorry guys, I'm still pretty tired, I've just written a huge article, so maybe not the most eloquent possible. But um, a cycle is basically the way a processor retrieves a piece of data from the memory. So, obviously, you don't want it wasting cycles. So if it takes a long ass time to receive that piece of data, effectively that CPU is just twiddling its thumbs. You're basically wasting uh, away that um, performance. Now, we knew previously some of this stuff like for example it was fairly obvious that the access time for the gddr5 memory although we didn't actually have the numbers like written down we didn't know what they were um one thing that is extremely interesting is you don't want to cross the data in other words um you don't want the most interesting thing that i personally saw and obviously, there was going to be a performance penalty in this because, uh, well, quite honestly speaking, of course, there's not a direct communication for the Jaguar cores, but also the two modules. So, for example, let's assume that you're... Let's just use module 1 and 2. Now, there is an architecture diagram in the article, so you could just check that out if you so desire, but I'll explain it to you verbally anyway. Let's assume that, well, we do have modules 1 and 2. So let's assume that module 1, CPU core 3, wants to access something that's in module 2's level 2 cache, right? So I'm going to say that one more time. The core 3, which is residing on module 1 of the two modules, wants to access something that's in module 2's level 2 cache. If it wants to do that, you're going to have a massive performance penalty. How much is massive, I hear you scream? Well, it's 190 cycles. Now, compared to the 30 cycles of it being in its own proper level 2 cache, you can see the absolute massive performance difference. Um, it's around, what is it, like 6 times, something like that. Uh, times the difference. In fact, it's verging on the same performance penalty as actually accessing something in RAM. And in some ways, it's actually worse. And I'll tell you why it's worse, because you're actually using up precious space in the level 2 cache that could be used for something better. So in effect, you're basically doing two bad things. One, you're wasting space in the wrong cache. And two, it's going to be slow as hell anyway. So it might as well be slow as hell in at least the, the memory where you've got plenty of space. So, now another very important piece of information, and we knew this anyway from technical documents that were released based on the AMD Jaguar. I've got these diagrams, by the way, linked in the, vid in the um, article. But uh, effectively, if you want to read one single byte of data, you're going to end up loading the entire 64 bytes, an entire 64 bytes in cache. Now that might not sound particularly large, but when you consider level 1 caches you're dealing with like 32kb, you could start seeing how much that is. Now, once again, if you're just wondering how the hell can 64 fit into 32, remember we're dealing with bytes versus kb, which is obviously, you know, quite a big difference, 1024 times to be precise. So that means that what you have to do is you have to start using creative thinking. Because what happens is, let's assume that you want to have a piece of data that's in both that needs to be accessed on let's assume um, both CPUs but needs to fit in the cache well if you unless you want to hit that large performance you're going to have to use what's known as padding because otherwise if you don't pad this of at least like 60 KB um, what's basically going to happen, sorry, 60 bytes, is you're going to pretty much hit the situation where it's going to have to cross-read between cores, which is 
not particularly ideal as we've already discussed. Finally, we're going to discuss um, the pipeline CPU. So a pipeline CPU is, and it's not that difficult to really understand. It's pretty much an idea of a result is connected to the previous result. So in other words, um, each logical step follows the next logical step. So in the case of a CPU, um, this basically means that the result from step A is going to be carried to step B, which then is going to be carried to step C, and so on. So a CPU works via instruction fetch. It in other words, it grabs the instruction, it decodes that instruction, and then executes the instruction, then it accesses the memory, and then it writes that result back into the memory, which is pretty simple to understand. I think most of you understood that. But then there's known as branching predictions. Now, a branching prediction is basically an if or else statement. So you could kind of consider this like going um, traveling to work. So let's assume that you're traveling to work and you're like, okay, what do I do? Do I take the highway or do I maybe take the back roads? Because let's assume that normally you just take the highway because it's going to be the fastest route, right? Let's say your journey is 20 minutes to work if you take the highway. On the other hand, let's assume that that day one of the lanes is shut down for maintenance. And so you're like, well, do I take the back way, which I know is going to take me about 30 minutes, or do I still take the highway? Because it might still be a bit faster depending on congestion. So this is like an if or an or statement. You've got to make that decision. It's not really simple anymore, is it? Because you have to kind of make a decision based upon the information you've got. And this is somewhat what a CPU has to do if it has to deal with an if or an or statement. Now, the PlayStation 3... Um, had, let's just use the word abysmal uh, branch predictions. It was bad. It was terrible. So unless you actually explicitly wrote what had to happen, you would often have these situations where the CPU would just be stalling. And it would be like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And then eventually it would basically predict a piece of information Let's assume it went with A, which it generally did. It went usually with like one piece of information. Well, that could be wrong. So it would then waste a bunch of cycles to calculate A, when in reality it could be B. So in effect, it's slower. Now, what happens with the Jaguar is it has out-of-order execution with advanced branch prediction. This basically means it's better at guessing which pieces of code um, have just come up. So if it's something that unexpected um, needs to be processed, it's going to have a lot less wait time, which means you're going to have a lot more efficient and correct compile. Uh, this means it's going to be a lot more efficient and a lot less reliant on the compiling of an application. So previously with the PS3, basically your performance really was reliant on the compiler. And in theory, this sounds fine, because then you think to yourself, well, I can control the code. I can compile it to be the most optimal possible. But you can't really predict a lot of the time what a player is going to do. So, for example, you can't really predict sometimes the action of a player or the, re the reactions to, like, AI. AI and physics and that type of thing are common examples of... Uh... <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I'm still, as I said, a little bit sick. So my voice sometimes goes a bit weird. Um... AI, physics, and so on are common examples of like if and or statements and stuff like that. So you can't really predict that and therefore you get some slowdown. So sometimes you might need to either calculate multiple results or, you know, it really depends, to be honest with you, what you're trying to accomplish at that particular time. Well, actually, guys, I realised there's one thing I haven't talked about and that is very naughty of me. I should have been slightly above, but I'm certainly not going to re-record everything just to add this little tip bit in. Um, a lot of this comes down to humour. Now, this isn't how funny something is. We're talking about H-U-M-A. I've discussed this heavily previously, and there's a lot more of it in the article that I've uh, plugged several times now in this video. But effectively, humour is basically the method that the GPU and CPU both access the same piece of RAM. So... Effectively speaking, there's not separate addresses for the CPU or the GPU. They're both addressing exactly the same memory space. So, 
this is all part of the PS4's architecture, and the PS4 has three buses. It's got um, the garlic, which is the fastest of them, 176 gigabytes per second. That connects the GDDR5 memory of the PS4 to the GPU, which of course makes sense considering it is the, well, the one that requires the most memory bandwidth. Then there's another one uh, known as the onion, which connects the PS4's memory to the CPU. And finally, there's another one which connects the CPU to the GPU, right? So basically, um, there was Chris Jenner, who actually commented on this in an interview, um, and he stated, uh, by the way, he was responsible for helping port the crew from the PC to the PS4. And he said the first performance problem is when we had not allocating memory correctly. So the Onion bus is very good for system stuff and can be accessed by the GPU. The garlic is very good at for rendering resources and can get a lot of data into the CPU. And one issue we had is that some of our shaders allocated in garlic, but the constant writing of code eventually had to read some stuff in the shaders to understand what what was meant to be writing. And because that was in the garlic memory, we had very slow read because it's not going through the CPU caches. That was one issue we had to sort out early on, making sure that everything is split into the correct memory regions, otherwise that can really slow you down. Anyway guys, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon, take care, and bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.